back to uh, North Baptist tonight. We're glad you're here. Uh, this past week, I was, uh, as I was in uh, studying for some things, I read up a little bit on the history of North Baptist Church, and I found out some pretty interesting things, pretty cool. Uh, but one of the things that I came across was uh, in the early 1940s, actually 1943, we had a young man come here to be the assistant pastor. And my ears sort of perked up when I was reading it, and it was none other than Al Smith. And Al Smith, if you know, was a great hymn writer. He wrote many hymns that we sing today. We're actually going to be singing one of his here in just a moment. But um, Al Smith was very instrumental in starting Singspiration music, as well as Youth for Christ. He was here at North from 1943 to 1945. When he left in 1945, he went back to Chicago to work directly with Billy Graham, George Beverly Shea, and the likes to uh, continue Youth for Christ. And I thought that was pretty interesting. So I went online and I actually emailed his son, David Smith, and told him that we're going to be singing a song. Actually, Be Thou Exalted, uh, Al Smith wrote the tune to. Uh, we, I told his son that we're going to be singing the song, Be Thou Exalted, for our evening service tonight. And I didn't expect really to get a response, but actually within the hour he replied to me and said, Thank you for your note. My father, Al Smith, actually started Singspiration and was instrumental in starting Youth for Christ as well. Uh, Dad always spoke fondly of his time at your church. God bless. And so I thought that was pretty interesting. Then he signed it like I used to sign some of my letters. Sing Searly, David e. B. Smith. So it was pretty, pretty interesting to have that connection this past week. So we're going to sing a song, the first and last verses of Be Thou Exalted, a song uh, written by Al Smith, the former assistant pastor here at North. So let's stand as we sing, Be Thou Exalted Forever and Ever. Exalted forever and ever, God of eternity, the ancient of days, wondrous in wisdom, majestic in glory, perfect in holiness, and worthy of praise. Be thou exalted by seraphs and angels. With harp and with song, saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. On the third, be thou exalted, O Spirit of power. Be thou exalted, O Spirit of power, dwelling within our hearts to keep us from sin. And with song, saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. All right, you may be seated. So good to see all of you here this morning, Let's, or this evening. Sorry, it's just making fun of somebody else who called it morning. So, so good to see all of you here tonight. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for your hand of protection, and grace, and mercy. We thank you for your love for us. Lord, how I pray that we would be the children that you want us to be, that we would serve you, and that we would love you with the same everlasting love that you have for us. Lord, may you be honored and glorified in everything that happens in this service. And Father, we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we love you. We 
be able to sing with family. And so um, at this time, we're actually going to take some, some time from our service this evening and give you an opportunity to share any testimonies that you would like to share with the church. Scripture tells us to let those uh, works of the Lord be made manifest and uh, let them be told. So if you have a testimony that you would just like to praise the Lord for, thank him for, uh, we'll take a few moments and do any of those tonight. So just raise a hand would be good, and I, we can just speak from there. And, oh, yes. Mm, amen. 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 Praise the Lord for that. Anybody else have one something to praise the Lord for? First one's out of the way, so the rest should be pretty easy. So. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. <laughs> no, uh, Lisa, yeah, go ahead. Amen for the church. The Lord's doing great things. Good, thank you, Lisa. I thought I saw a hand over here somewhere. Yes, go ahead. Ladies' prayer time this Tuesday. 10 o'clock. All right. Anybody else have? Yes. Amen. Amen. Anybody else have one? Amen. Well, those are good. We're going to sing two songs. Speaking of our Lord, worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Then we're going to go into the chorus, my wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord. So you can remain seated. We'll sing the three verses of song number three, worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Worthy of worship. Worthy. 
worship and praise. Worthy of reverence, worthy of fear, worthy of love and devotion. Wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord. We'll sing that through just one time. My wonderful Lord, my wonderful Lord, my angels and seraphs in heaven adored, I know thou art mine, my Savior dear. Enjoy singing about our Lord. Just a couple announcements before we prepare for our offering tonight. Uh, as you heard this morning, our picnic is next week, next Sunday. And so be ready for that. Sign up. The, bullet, the new sign-up sheets, if you're not aware, are just to the left as soon as you exit, right around that corner next to the nursery. And so if you could sign up, I think uh, one of the sign-up columns was pretty lacking. I think it might have been fruit or vegetables. So check that out. Uh, if you can sign up for anything like that, that would be awesome. We're going to have a great time. We are going to have some uh, games and stuff for the young ones. And so if you are um, staying for that, just come prepare. Prepared, and it's always a great time for that. Again, I said this morning we're having an outreach opportunity for the CRIM. So if you are running or walking in any of the races, um, there's 10 mile, there's 8K, 5K, a mile, uh, men and women, then walk and run. So if you are doing any of those, or if you're thinking about doing any of those, let me know. Uh, we're going to have sort of a little incentive there. So if you can help out, that would be great. Let me know. Uh, Women for Mission is this Thursday, I believe, at 9.30, so uh, be ready for that. Also, our prayer meetings, men's at 8.30 and ladies at 10 on Tuesday. So men, if you'll come forward for their offering tonight, and we will take that. Remember, Women for Mission is collecting school supplies for Carriage Town in the black box in the lobby, and so any donation would help with that. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the chance we have to give back to you, Lord, to uh, just show you uh, just our appreciation for the great gift that you've given to us of salvation. And Lord, that we can have a chance to meet tonight, just what a privilege that is. Lord, we ask that you will take what's uh, given tonight and use it. And Lord, help it to further your work, the work that's going on here at North Baptist Church. And Lord, that we can just use it to proclaim your gospel, to continue your work that you've, bl you've blessed us with. Lord, we pray that you will just give us a great evening tonight. Lord, give us a great week as well in your service. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
it's been a, <coughs> a month since uh, I've been uh, uh, reading a missionary letter, and, and you can be forgotten. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this is from the McKinley family. There are missionaries that are on their way to Ireland. Matter of fact, they're there right now. Uh, here's what they have to say. They say you know it's summer in Ireland when the rain gets warmer. Well, warmer is relative. Preparations. In May, we finished our final meeting in Indiana and then returned to Minnesota for quick preparations to head to Ireland for the summer. We packed to stay long term should the Lord provide the remainder of our support in the coming months. Steve was ordained at our home church on Sunday, May the 22nd, and two days later our family was in transit over the Atlantic. It all happened quickly, but we are glad to have arrived safely and now to be serving for a good while in the place of our calling. We praise God for the partnership of two new churches, Steadfast Baptist Church of Berrytown, Michigan, and Calvary Baptist Church of Beloit, Kansas. That puts us at 76%. In Ireland, we are thankful to be back in Ireland for a second extended stay for ministry with a church plant. We had nearly a week of overlap with the Finleys before their departure and then we hit the ground running. Over the past several weeks, we have had many opportunities to share the gospel with people on the street and through knocking on doors. In our previous video update, I mentioned a Muslim man and two Mormon missionaries. We have not had any more contact with them since. However, we had a few conversations with Jehovah Witnesses. One of those was a three-hour meeting we had in the home of a Polish family whose teenage daughter interpreted for us. We have also shared the gospel with many Catholic people who are hoping that the religion will be sufficient to satisfy a holy and just God. One Irish Catholic man named John was invited us into his home for two exchange Bible studies. He is dealing with substance abuse and other demons from his past. Please pray for him that he will be open for a third study. Another Irish man named Christy, whom I met on the street two weeks ago, called me on Monday to report that he read the Gospel of John as I suggested and was wondering what he should read next. He also peppered me with questions about Catholic and Baptist doctrine. Please pray that we'll be able to engage him in a Bible study soon. There are many others that have heard the full salvation message. We look to the Holy Spirit to do his convincing work in, in their hearts. With God, all things are possible, and that's McKinley's. They have a couple of praises here. Support is up to 76%. We are getting settled into the work in Athom. The gospel is being preached, and we are seeing fruit. That's the praise, and now they have some prayer requests. <clears throat> John and Christy for our continued contact and their salvation. That God will give us great opportunity and boldness to share the gospel. That's a couple of prayer requests. Uh, thank you for praying for our missionaries and the interest that you have uh, with our uh, on our missions committee. Pray for them as we make decisions in uh, the next year on supporting new missionaries and and perhaps a trip, a mission trip next summer. So be praying about those things. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for that, Jack. Song number 108 in your songbooks. 108 is written by. The man that when uh, L. Smith left North Baptist in 1945, he went to Chicago to work hand in hand with Billy Graham and George Beverly Shea, probably one of the most prolific gospel songwriters of the 20th century. And uh, George Beverly Shea wrote this next song, The Wonder of It All. There's a wonder of sunset at evening, the wonder as sunrise I see, but the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God loves me. So we'll sing both verses of this. Let's stand as we sing, The Wonder of It All. Wonder of sunset. There's the wonder of sunset at evening. The wonder at sunrise I see. But the wonder of wonders that thrills my soul is the wonder that God. Oh, the wonder of it all, the wonder. 
imbécile. All right, if you've got your Bibles, would you turn into the book of 1 Samuel, please? 1 Samuel chapter 16. And while you are turning there, you are looking at partnering this coming school year with Eisenhower Elementary to do a mentoring program and to be a help to them in any way we can. We're going to try to adopt that school and pray for those kids and pray for those teachers. And they are looking for all kinds of participants to help in various functions in the school. And we have been asked if we have anyone in our congregation that likes to play with Legos. <clears throat> now, here's what they're doing. Legos of today were not the Legos that your kids used to play with. Because now they're all about robotics. And what they're looking at is starting a Lego club and they are hoping to find someone that has a mechanical engineering mindset. That counts me out quickly. So if you have that kind of a desire, if you have that kind of an interest, if you think that would be fun, uh, if you would be curious to know more information to help these young kids with a Lego robotics club, uh, as soon as I get the information, uh, I would be sure and share that with you. But if that's something that would be of interest to you, uh, the whole reason we want to adopt this school and partner with this school is to give some kids who have a very rough life a sound adult presence uh, in their life. Uh, when we were at Woodland Elementary, it was heartbreaking uh, to talk to some of these kids. And uh, uh, so I know that... Uh, Eisenhower Elementary is probably no different and we want to uh, bring the love of Christ and be an encouragement to these kids in any way that we can be and as we get more information uh, about how we can help whether it's mentoring or backpack programs or whatever we'll certainly bring that to you but if you like to play with Legos and you have a robotics engineering mindset uh, let me know and uh, we'll get that information to you as quickly as possible. I want to look tonight out of 1 Samuel 16 and verse, 1 Samuel 17 for just a few minutes at God's choosing of a king. We're going to look here at David uh, taking the place of King Saul, his father-in-law, and we're going to look at the steps in which God um, chose David and prepared David and encouraged David and enabled David. David and what God does for David he can do for each and every one of us so we're going to look tonight at God's choice for a king in 1 Samuel 16 and 17 the first thing we're going to see is that God chose David had the Israelites had their choice of who their king would be it certainly would not have been David but praise God David was God's choice and God quickly tells Samuel to quit mourning over the loss of Saul and to go to Bethlehem and to find a man named Jesse. And Samuel did what he was told. David was the eighth son of Jesse. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 10. Again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen thee. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. So verse 10 tells us that Jesse sent seven of his sons past Samuel, but not David. Look at chapter 17 and verse 12. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. But now let me read something to you out of the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 2. Listen to these verses. And Jesse begot his firstborn, Eliab, and Abinadab the second, and Shema the third, Nathaniel the fourth, Radii the fifth, Ozem the sixth, David the seventh. We have found controversy in the King James Bible. 
Because 1 Samuel says he has eight sons. 1 Chronicles says he has seven. If you will study your Old Testament history, you will find that it is not named, from what I can tell, but Jesse uh, had another son who died, and his name was taken out of all Bible genealogies. But it's amazing here that God tells Samuel, I want you to go to Jesse, because this is where you're going to find your next king. And he didn't tell Samuel who it was. He didn't tell Jesse who it was. But can you imagine if a man of God is coming to your house and your father and your brothers don't even bother telling you about it because you were that insignificant shepherd boy out in the field. And so here comes a prophet of the Most High God to your house. He's sizing up all the sons. And meanwhile, David is tending sheep. It wasn't even important enough for Jesse to go get David. Because David was nothing more than an insignificant shepherd boy. But Psalm 23 tells us that the Lord was a shepherd. And in John chapter 10 and verse 11, Jesus says, I am what? The good shepherd. So David here was in pretty good company. But David had the heart of a shepherd and God knew it, which is why when Samuel goes to this son, and this son, and this son, and this son. Samuel said, no, that is not who God has in mind. And finally, we get to David. David had the heart of a shepherd, and God knew it. David was a small-town shepherd, keeping watch over a few wayward sheep. But God was calling him to be a shepherd over an entire nation of wayward people. So, what can we learn about God choosing David? It's very simple. God has chosen each one of us as his children to do something, and not just something or, uh, um, uh, uh, mundane, because our God is better than that. God has chosen something for each one of us that's extraordinary. And he wants us to know that if God chooses us, then we can do whatever it is he's asked us to do. And we shouldn't let people in the world tell us, no, you can't do that. Because there are a lot of naysayers out there. And so we see here, point number one, that God chose David. You and I know that God has chosen something for us as well. Number two, we see God prepared David. David. I've never met David. Um, hope to in heaven. God allowed for him to be strong and handsome and musical and, and, and brave and a uh, warrior. He was unafraid. And when God has a job for us to do, he will always equip us to do exactly what it is he needs us to do. Uh, you, you've heard that statement, God does not call the equipped. He equips the call. And so God will always provide us with the skills, the tools, the assets we need. We have to remember that the greatest tool that God can ever give us is the tool of faith. If we have faith in the Lord, we can accomplish whatever it is he has for us to do. Look at 1 Samuel 16 and verse 14. We're going to see here that the Spirit of God had left Saul the king of Israel. Look at 1 Samuel 16, verse 14. We're talking here about God preparing David. The Bible tells us in verse 14, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. We know that Saul then very quickly became uh, suspicious and revengeful and downright evil and mean. He plotted to kill David and he wanted to kill his own son, Jonathan. But God prepared David for such a time as this that he could go before his father-in-law and comfort him and calm him. We know that David could play all kinds of instruments. We know that he could write songs and write lyrics and write uh, the, uh, the psalms. And, and David, it's, it, these are interesting traits, are they not? To find in a young man 
that could also fight lions and, and bears and giants. The key to David's success, though, is found at the end of verse 18. Look, if you will, at 1 Samuel 16 and verse 18. Look at the very last. We'll, we'll read the whole verse. Then answered one of the servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person, and the Lord is with him. So he lists all those assets, all those strengths, all those abilities, all those skills, but then he said, and God is with him. David knew what his gifts were. He felt the power of God in his life on a daily basis as he used these gifts. Now, in their original meeting between King Saul and David, they had a fondness and an affection for each other as a father-in-law and son should. Look at uh, 1 Samuel 16 and verse 21. It says, And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. But that love was eventually replaced by uh, revenge and, and wickedness and fear because, as we know, David killed Goliath. Saul was afraid to go out after Goliath, but David was not. And when they came back from the great victory of, of, of killing all of the Philistines, including Goliath, what did the lady say? David, uh, 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 Saul has killed his thousands, but David ten thousands. And that didn't set well with Saul, and he immediately became jealous and envious to the point that he wanted to kill his own son-in-law. But the amazing thing about it is, through all of this, because of the way God had prepared David to deal with the trials of life, David was still able to love and care for his evil, wicked father-in-law, because we know that there were a couple of instances in a cave where David had him cornered and could have taken him out in no time. But he didn't, because David said, you are God's chosen vessel at one point. And David said, I just can't do it. So, what can we learn when we see that God prepared David? As God calls you and me to do something, he will always prepare you for whatever it is he has in store. And he will give you every gift and every ability that you need to accomplish what he's asked us to do. So God chose David. Number two, God prepared David. Number three, God encouraged David. You know, whenever you step out in faith to do something for the Lord, there are always going to be those around you who will discourage you. Unfortunately, that often begins at home. Does it not? You know, and, 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 and I got an example of that here this morning. And it just broke my heart. And, and, and I won't get into details, but it just, it just broke my heart. David's oldest brother Eliab, when, when, when uh, all the Israelites were out uh, cowering against the Philistines on the battlefield and would not fight them, David goes out, he takes them food and makes sure they're okay, and, and Eliab says, what are you doing here? Who's watching the sheep? Get back where you belong. You just want to see the action, right? Look at 1 Samuel 17 and verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And, and who, with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. So Eliab here is getting all over his brother saying, you just want to see what's going on. You're not being responsible. You're not watching the sheep. So it was uh, David's oldest brother here who was discouraging him. We know as we just studied over the past several Wednesday nights that Joseph, had a couple of divine dreams from God regarding Joseph's future and how he was going to uh, be reunited and restore the relationship with his family and how during the famine in Egypt that uh, God would use Joseph to not only spare his family but the entire known world. And Joseph's brothers laughed at him and they mocked him to the point that they wanted to kill him. 
We know that Jeremiah's own family wanted to kill him. When he constantly warned the Israelites of Judah, you need to stop sinning or God's going to judge you. His own family wanted to kill him. We know that uh, Moses' own brother and sister uh, criticized him. And Jesus said in Matthew 10 and verse 36, he said this, um, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. And so we talk here about God encouraging David. It, it hurts when people around you tell you you can't do something. You're not good enough. You're not big enough. You're not strong enough. You're not old enough. It hurts when people tell you you can't do something. It hurts even more when it might be close friends telling you you can't do something. It hurts the worst, it stings the most when it's your own family that tells you you can't do something. That is just not encouraging. But God encouraged David. You know, look at, uh, look at 1 Samuel 17 and we'll see that King Saul was of no encouragement to David when he started to fight Goliath. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 33. Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he had a man, and, and he a man of war from his youth. Boy, don't take this the wrong way, but does that not make Saul look like an absolute fool? Because he was completely discounting what God can do through the person he chooses to do something. Here was King Saul, one of the most powerful men in the world. And he is completely discounting God. You know, King Saul kind of sounds like the, the uh, we know the 12 spies went out into the land of Canaan. And 10 of them came back with a very bad report. Oh, it's beautiful out there, but there's giants. And there's no way that we can defeat them. But folks, David did not draw his encouragement from men. He drew his encouragement from God. Go to 1 Samuel 30. Look at 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. This is a little bit later on, just before the death of Saul. But look at what David uh, is, is said about him in 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6. David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. You know, King Saul knew nothing about the mighty and wonderful power of God because his heart was wrong. He had lost his relationship with the Holy Spirit. So what can we learn about God encouraging David and how God can encourage us. Folks, when we walk by sight, that always has to include the human element and the human perspective. We're calculating everything from a human perspective. And this will almost always lead to discouragement and failure. But when we walk by faith, we are bringing God into the equation. Think about this. What did David walk into that battle with Goliath with? Outside of faith, there wasn't much, was there? A sling and five little stones. Which takes us to our fourth point. God enabled David. David was going to battle Goliath in the name of Almighty God. We know that for 40 days, Goliath cursed and blasphemed the name of God. But David was going to set that straight. Look at 1 Samuel 17 and verse 16. 1 Samuel 17, we'll start in 15. It says, But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. Drop down to verse 43. Here we have the battle between David and Goliath. And it says, in the Philistine, verse 43, said unto David, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. You know, Goliath, probably the biggest man in the world at the time, right? Some nine feet tall. He was a ferocious beast. He was a man among men. And he was 
militarily covered with the latest uh, uh, war fashions and protection of the day. Probably could not be defeated. Look at 1 Samuel 17 and verse 4. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had an, a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Can you imagine? He looked like a walking tank, did he not? He was invincible. And all of the Israelites knew it. Except a little kid named David. And King Saul says, there's no way you can beat him, but I'm going to let you have my armor. And David tried it on and said, no thanks. God enabled David. He didn't have the military protection, but look at what he did have. 1 Samuel 17 and verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. David had such a great confidence in God, because David could go back to the other trials and battles of his life, and know that God was there to protect him. And so he had no reason to think that if I am doing right, and if this giant is cursing my God, I'm going to fight him, and by faith, God's going to give me victory. You know, there are people in this world who make things happen, there are people who watch things happen, and there are people who wonder what just happened. Right? Folks, God wants us as his children to be people that make things happen for his honor and glory. And he is going to choose us, he's going to prepare us, he's going to encourage us, and he's going to enable us to do whatever he's called. So what can we learn from God enabling David? David did not see a nine-foot giant covered in armor. He didn't see that at all. David saw an evil enemy of the Lord who was cursing God, and David knew it was wrong. David didn't see a nine-foot giant. He saw evil versus good. He saw right versus wrong. He saw God versus Satan. And so as we see here this evening, as God chose David, and prepared him, and encouraged him, and enabled him, God is going to do the exact same things for us. And if we allow him to do those things, and if we walk by faith, folks, what a hoot it would be to get to the end of our lives and see what God accomplished through you and me. Heavenly Father, how I pray that each and every one of us would search for and know what it is you've called for us to do. The, the plans that you have for us. The victories that you want us to achieve. The souls you want us to lead to Christ. Lord, help us to know that we are chosen by you. We are set aside, chosen, special vessels. And God, help us to know that those that you have chosen, you are going to properly prepare. And then, Lord, we also know that you will forever encourage us. And that, Lord, whatever it is you've called us to do, you will enable us to be successful. Father, I pray that you would uh, be with each and every person that's here tonight. You've called them, you've chosen them for something. God, help us to have a desire to know what that is. 
and that we would pursue it with a vigor and with a fervor like David did going after Goliath. And that we would have the faith to know that you will give us the victory. Father, we thank you for your word. Bless us in this invitation. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sing song number 465, Only Trust Him. We'll sing the first and the second. 465, let's stand as we sing, Only Trust Him. You know the biggest thing that keeps us from having victory for the Lord? Too much fear, not enough faith. It's just that simple. Too much fear and not enough faith. You know, we don't read it. it man, if, if, if I came up, if, if I walked into the church doors and there was some nine foot dude that was dressed in the latest military garb of the day. I would either pass out or I would turn around and run as fast as I could. My first thought would not be, God, give me faith and victory here. I would run like a scared rabbit. Nowhere in this account do we see where David was afraid. You know why? Because he had so much faith in God. Folks, if God's called you to do something, have the faith to know that he's going to help you be victorious in it. He just will. He, he, he has no desire to see us fail. And the only failure that comes would be from our end. So may God help us to know what he's called us to do and to have the faith to do it. Sure appreciate you being here tonight. I hope you have a great week. Don't forget the activities coming up this week with Ladies